thinking better and thinking together about life's most important issues. A place to finally meet in the middle, to think freely and reasonably about the big questions of life. This is Thinker Sensitive. Welcome to the fourth episode of our season on the question of God. My name is Ryan Ragazine, and I am your host. On today's episode, we're going to be discussing common myths and stereotypes. Humans have always been fascinated with myths, drawn to and allured by tall tales of prehistoric legends and epic dramas often revolving around the rise and fall of some heroic, godlike figure. Greek mythology and Greco-Roman tragedies are the most popular examples. But myths can take on many forms, and they can have many applications. There are several recent examples in American history, like the legend of Sasquatch, also known as Bigfoot, or the mythology surrounding the Fountain of Youth, which you can visit today in St. Augustine, Florida. But in American folklore, no figure stands taller, both literally and figuratively, than Paul Bunyan, the giant lumberjack and folk hero of North America. Traditionally accompanied by Babe the Blue Ox, according to Britannica, Paul was first introduced to a general audience by a Minnesota advertiser in a series of pamphlets used to publicize the products of the Red River Lumber Company in the early to mid-20th century. These pamphlets influenced Esther Shepard, who wrote about the mythic hero in a book called Paul Bunyan, which was published in 1924. Though some claim that he was a real person, and though some of his feats may have been based on true stories, Paul Bunyan was not a real person, and the giant axe-wielding lumberjack with a blue ox was probably not based on a real person either. Similar to the way in which the myth of Paul Bunyan can be demythologized and debunked, There are various myths about faith and belief that can be and should be debunked as well. This is part of what I will set out to do in this episode. Stereotypes have also been quite common in both human and American history. Many of these stereotypes are racial in nature, and they are often ignorant and offensive like the idea that all Italian people have family ties to the mafia, or that all Italian people like garlic, wine, and spaghetti, or that all Italian people have greasy hair and oily skin. Now, in my experience, all these things are true. It's absolutely dead on. But these stereotypes can be taken offensively and they can be understood as pejorative and insulting. Likewise, there are also many popular stereotypes that persist today about people of faith and believers in God. Stereotypes that are both ignorant and offensive. So part of this episode will also be dedicated to neutralizing and countering such stereotypes. The next two episodes, including this one, will be a review of some concepts that I've discussed in previous episodes, particularly in episodes 47 and 48. I don't typically like to rehash or repeat things, but these ideas are important to the question of God, and I'll be playing off some of these ideas in some of the later episodes in this season. 
So I'm going to replay and patch together a couple old recordings in this episode specifically. That way, I don't have to re-record and re-edit content that I've already created. But a lot of the content in these episodes will be new as well, as I'll be filling several things in as I go. So let's begin. The first myth that I'm going to attempt to dispel is the agnostic myth, which says that the question of God is not worth asking because no meaningful answer can be provided to the question. Thinking about the question is a waste of time because we'll simply never come up with a sufficient or satisfying answer. There's a lot of things that I can say about this. First, some of the most beautiful minds to ever exist, and some of the most critical scholars to ever live, believed in God with a high degree of confidence and a high level of certitude. And they had good reasons for why they believed in God with a high degree of confidence and a high level of certitude. Second, just because the question of God can never be definitively settled on a universal level in time doesn't mean that no data or evidence exists. There are literally thousands of examples of questions and debates that will never be answered and settled objectively with 100% certainty in human experience. And yet this ambiguity or equivocation doesn't stop people from entering into discussions on such matters. In philosophy, A good example would be the debate between freedom and determinism. In politics, a good example would be economic philosophies, like the unending debate between capitalism and socialism. In sports, fans argue incessantly about which team is better or which sport is better. In education, We have debates about what form of education is best, and the list goes on and on, with no end to these debates in sight. Yet people still feel that these questions are worth pursuing, and people on both sides of the debate still feel that they have good evidence in order to build a good case for their individual stances. Third, there is a lack of existential, experiential, and reflective engagement with the question of God in our society. If this took place more often, I don't think that there would be as many people out there who think that there is no answer to the question. See, you are the answer to the question. The evidence is found in your very existence. The very fact that you can formulate the thought that there is no evidence that God exists and that you can communicate this thought in a coherent manner is evidence that God exists. For God is revealed in your rationality. Your agnosticism Your very refusal to answer the question, your deliberate free choice, is proof in and of itself that God exists. For God is revealed in your freedom. Fourth, the implications of this question, the question of all questions, are far too important and far too vast to leave it open or unanswered. There are a couple of stereotypes that I want to address at this point. The first is that theists are people of faith, whereas atheists and agnostics are people of reason. In order to respond to this stereotype, I'm going to play you an excerpt from episode 48 where I assert that all people are people of faith, 
not just believers in God. Give it a listen. I've stated many times on this podcast that all human knowledge is faith-based. Today I'm going to begin to unpack this statement on a broad level. In the future, I'll probably get into the specifics. But this podcast is going to be an introduction to the topic, a teaser in a way. Historically, this concept is grounded in post-Enlightenment, post-critical, and post-modern thinking, which rightly criticized modernity and the Enlightenment for its overconfidence, naive objectivity, arrogance, and dogmatism. Now, I'm not a full-on postmodern thinker, but I do agree with many of the criticisms put forth by various postmodern philosophers. Like many movements in human thought, postmodern thought is a bit of an overstatement and a bit of an overreaction, but it can be helpful in swinging the pendulum to the middle as things begin to even out over time. Today, I'm going to narrow this discussion to the context of belief in God, or a lack thereof, to the context of theism, agnosticism, and atheism, mainly because there are a lot of misconceptions here. Before we begin, let's define our terms. Theism is belief in God. Agnosticism is the refusal to make a decision about God on the basis of a lack of information or evidence in either direction. Atheism is the belief that God doesn't exist. Here is my predictable but countercultural take on these three systems of thought. Similar to my illustration about color, faith directly applies to all three of these approaches to the question of God, not just to one of them. All three of these approaches are approaches of faith, expressions of personal belief, opinions, not matters of fact, reflections of human subjectivity, not human objectivity. But this runs against popular belief, prevailing understandings and misconceptions that, I think, are blindly accepted by faith. This runs counter to all the false dichotomies and polarizations that are created on this topic. See, the prevailing belief on the matter is that faith and reason are mutually exclusive, that they are divergent paths. We've come to believe that only the believer in God is a person of faith. Only the theist exercises faith. The atheist and the agnostic don't. In direct contrast to the believer in God, those who don't believe in God are people of reason. We even have this term believer, which is only used for the theist. Is this not the case? Am I misreading the societal sentiments? Am I misreading the tea leaves? Is this not what many people believe and assume to be true? The reality is that even the agnostic is a person of faith, let alone the person who believes, who has faith, that God doesn't exist. As an agnostic, which I used to be, by the way, I was agnostic for most of my adolescence. As an agnostic, I have to have faith. I have to believe that there is not enough information to make an informed decision about God. That's a subjective opinion, one that clearly many people disagree with and have disagreed with throughout history. The big question for me is this Has the agnostic really thought through the issues? Has the agnostic truly weighed the information? 
the data, the evidence? Or has the agnostic blindly accepted agnosticism as a default stance, assuming it to be the most reasonable position? Is the agnostic a fetist? Does the agnostic have blind faith or faith supported by reason? These are the big questions. See, the question is not whether the agnostic has faith. The question is what kind of faith does the agnostic have? That's what I care most about. For me, when I was agnostic, I didn't have the categories necessary to think through these things in a logical manner and to make an informed decision either way. I didn't know where to begin. I think that most people struggle with this and find themselves in a similar position. But a lack of awareness is not the same thing as a lack of information. A lack of knowledge of the evidence is not the same thing as a lack of evidence itself. Soren Kierkegaard is a really helpful source and companion on this. One of Kierkegaard's biggest things was the importance of making a decision and living into it. He understood that truth was experienced in decision and in a personal history that participates in that decision. This is why he's known as the father of existentialism. He was a theist and a Christian, which is ironic because many modern existentialists that followed in his footsteps are agnostics and atheists. If this is true of agnosticism, then this is certainly true of atheism. The atheist is a believer, a person of faith, and often possesses a lot of the same characteristics that the religious person possesses. See, the question of God is a debatable question by definition. It is not a question that can ever be definitively answered in space-time. One can't prove with absolute certainty that God exists, but neither can one prove with any certainty that God doesn't exist. This is why the question has been debated throughout history and will continue to be debated until time ceases. If theism and atheism are not matters of fact, then they are matters of belief and matters of faith. There are super intelligent people on both sides of this debate, which is why the kind of insults and mockery that you hear from both sides is entirely uncalled for. You are not dumb or stupid for believing that God doesn't exist. In fact, some of the smartest and sharpest people that I know don't believe in God. With that said, you are also not dumb and stupid if you believe in God. Some of the smartest people to ever walk this earth were believers in the traditional sense. In my opinion, this is not a matter of intelligence. This is not a matter of IQ, but a matter of human subjectivity. Once again, my main concern is with blind faith which can be found on both sides of the issue. It is one thing to place faith into something without any evidence. It is another thing to support my faith with rational argumentation. In the same way, it's one thing to reject the reality of something thoughtlessly, as a blind expression of dismissiveness. It is another thing to base my rejection on sound reasoning and serious thought. There are theists who have blind faith, and there are theists who have rational faith. There are atheists who have blind faith, and there are atheists who have rational faith. I personally believe that in every area of life, but especially with the big questions of life, an informed decision is always better than an uninformed decision. So again, 
The question is not whether the atheist has faith. The question is what kind of faith does the atheist have? I don't have to say anything about the theist here, about me, because we already assume and know that the theist, that I, am a person of faith. The second stereotype that I want to address is that theists are naive and gullible, more dictated by emotions and feelings, and more susceptible to delusion. Whereas atheists are critical and skeptical, more dictated by rationality and logic, and less susceptible to delusion. My response to this stereotype is found in episode 47, which is titled Faith or Reason. There's definitely some overlap here, but give it a listen. As the popular argument goes, because religion is based on faith, religion is unreasonable and nonsensical. Therefore, religious people themselves are unreasonable and nonsensical. This reasoning then flows very nicely to the issue of religion and fanaticism. Religious people are more prone to delusion because religious people are faith-oriented, and they are therefore more likely to believe unreasonable and nonsensical things. Christopher Hitchens once famously said, quote, Faith is the surrender of the mind. It's the surrender of reason. It's the surrender of the only thing that makes us different from other animals. It's our need to believe and to surrender our skepticism and our reason, our yearning to discard that and put all our trust or faith in someone or something. That is the sinister thing to me. Out of all the virtues, all the supposed virtues, Faith must be the most overrated, end quote. If you've listened to my content, including my previous seasons, you will know where I stand on this issue. I disagree with Hitchens' assessment for a variety of different reasons, ironically. First, as a non-believer, Hitchens' own admission to the idea that reason sets humans apart from animals, something that I wholeheartedly agree with, is an admission, whether he realizes it or not, to the non-reducible, the transcendental, the miraculous. Like many Christian philosophers and theologians, I believe in miracles, and the human mind is one of the greatest miracles of all. This was most likely Karl Rahner's greatest and most lasting contribution. I would argue that Kant, probably someone who understood the richness and depth of the human mind in a way that very few have, understood this without fully connecting the dots. Thinkers like Alvin Plantinga and John Lennox, professors at Notre Dame and Oxford respectively, argue for the transcendental nature of the human mind explicitly. C.S. Lewis, in his work Miracles, also recognizes that the human mind is essentially the greatest miracle of all. See, I believe that the human being is a miracle. You are a walking, talking miracle of God. I believe that the very fact that Hitchens can form rational arguments and can reason about faith and reason is a direct testament to non-reducible and transcendent human nature. Hitchens possesses a beautiful mind capable of astonishing things and limitless ideas because Hitchens is a creation of the living God. Second, I believe that the vast majority of the greatest thinkers to ever walk this earth were believers and people of faith, 
at least in the general sense. Plato, Aristotle, Justin Martyr, Clement of Alexandria, Athanasius, Origen, Augustine, Anselm, Aquinas, Bonaventura, Occam, Scotus, Luther, Calvin, Zwingli, Descartes, Pascal, Leibniz, Locke, Spinoza, Berkeley, Rousseau, Galileo, Copernicus, Kant, Kepler, Newton, Einstein, Kierkegaard, Shakespeare, Dante, Chesterton, Tolstoy, probably Dostoevsky, Tolkien, Da Vinci, Michelangelo, T.S. Eliot, Dickens, Milton, Bach, Hegel, Bart, Bonhoeffer, Bruner, Kuhn, and Ponenberg, to name just a few. The list truly goes on and on and on into eternity itself. Most of these figures directly connected faith and reason, belief and rationality, supporting their faith in God with rational argumentation, sometimes in the most rigid and painstaking of fashions. Many of these figures were also extremely skeptical and critical by nature, not naive and gullible. I follow some philosophy accounts on Instagram, and it's always very interesting to me to see what these accounts post and what they don't post. Almost every philosophy account that I follow exclusively posts quotes from late Enlightenment and modern atheistic and agnostic philosophers. This is an extremely small sample size and it represents a very limited portion of the history of philosophy. To me, the selectiveness shows clear personal bias. Honestly, it's borderline disingenuous to me because these accounts represent philosophy, whether implicitly or explicitly, as inherently agnostic and atheistic. But this couldn't be further from the truth. Again, the majority of the preeminent thinkers and figures in the history of philosophy believed in some form of God. And many of them were practicing Christians. This view that philosophy is opposed to religious belief and faith in God is a modern falsehood. And it's usually the result of historical ignorance, an ahistorical worldview that deifies self in the present moment. The idea that my current thinking in my current time is better than all other thinking in all other times. My third point is very technical. But if I'm going to explain why I don't think that faith and reason are mutually exclusive, then I'm going to have to get a little technical here. But if this is too technical for you, please don't feel bad about just skipping past this portion. I think the crux of the issue lies in the confusion of reason with strict or direct empiricism. The idea that all knowledge comes from direct experience via the physical senses. Sight, taste, touch, hearing, smell. David Hume was one of the founding fathers of this idea. In the modern scientific age, many have come to believe that strict empiricism is the only means to trustworthy knowledge. What many people don't realize is how limited and ahistorical this outlook is. Empiricism is a form of knowledge, no doubt. But it is not the only form of knowledge. If it were, 
our knowledge of both ourselves and the world around us would be quite limited. The inductive method itself has natural limitations that are actually directly related to the natural limitations of empiricism. In the history of philosophy, going back to the dawn of the Enlightenment, empiricism and rationalism were actually understood as two competing methods and theories of knowledge. Yes, there was a time when two philosophical programs, known as empiricism and rationalism, were pinned against each other and seen as opposing methods, kind of like how faith and reason are today. Kant created a Copernican revolution in philosophy by wedding these two systems of thought in a very nuanced way. Likewise, many modern and contemporary philosophers of religion and philosophical theologians wed faith and reason together. But the point is this. When people pit faith and reason against each other, really what they're doing is pitting faith and empiricism against each other. Or more accurately, they are creating a strict bifurcation between a mix of a priori and empirical knowledge on one hand and strict empiricism on the other. Faith and strict empiricism may seem like opposites, though even that statement is highly debatable, and it would depend on what one means when they say something like that. But anyway, faith and strict empiricism may seem like opposites. But faith and reason itself are not opposites. Contrary to popular belief, reason and strict empiricism are not the same things. Fourth and finally, as I've stated before, all human knowledge is faith-based whether empirical or rational, posteriori or a priori, based on direct physical sensory experience, or based on reflection and contemplation. All human knowledge, that is, all faith-based knowledge, lies on a spectrum of various gradations and degrees, moving all the way from incredulity to certitude. So the idea that faith and reason are alternatives is naive. It's backwards. It's stuck in the past. Stuck in the Enlightenment. And stuck in modernity. Reason itself is faith-based. In many different ways. And on many different levels. Getting back to some common myths. The legend of scientism is another tall tale that can and should be debunked. Scientism is the belief that science can answer all human questions and can explain all things, usually objectively and with absolute certainty. The thing is, scientism is faith-based just like any religious worldview. Scientism itself cannot be substantiated by the scientific method. Science has real limits and boundaries. It can only inform us about the empirical. Scientism essentially assumes that only the empirical exists, which is simply a faith-based presumption that science itself, by nature, cannot speak to. The myth of scientism is very closely related to the myth of strict empiricism, which I dealt with a bit in the last excerpt that I played, but it's worth mentioning again at this point. This legend says that sense data is the only trustworthy means to knowledge, and the only things that are directly and immediately sensible exist. Again, this myth is faith-based, 
It can't be proven by science and the inductive method, and it's highly debatable. Also, if only the directly and immediately sensible exist, then hardly anything exists, let alone God. There are hundreds of things that we place our faith in on a daily basis without the aid of empirical verification including faith in our senses and our minds. Invoking this myth, many have posited that because God is not an empirical being or object, he does not exist. Because we cannot directly and physically sense God, he is purely imaginary. There are several responses to this. First, None of the major world religions believe that God is physical slash empirical, and there are many good theological reasons for this. Second, if God were so, how would this affect the integrity of human experience, our morality, and our freedom? If God was floating around us and staring us in the face, while we were about to steal a mug at a gift shop, do you think this would influence our action or our choice? A spiritually present God creates an environment of moral authenticity and freedom. Third, faith in the absence of direct empirical data is virtuous and formational, instilling courage trust, vulnerability, risk-taking, fortitude, and even sincere devotion and love. This same kind of faith must be exercised in almost all of our interpersonal relationships, including both our friendships and our romantic relationships. This episode and all episodes of Thinker Sensitive are available on thinkersensitive.com, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and more. Subscribe on your favorite podcast app today to listen to more thought-provoking content from Thinker Sensitive.